you can't afford to be an average software engineer. Have you noticed all the videos being made of how to get ahead of 99% of software engineers? Well, the reason a title like this does well is because there's an insecurity, and the insecurity is well founded. The tech layoffs haven't stopped. So whether you're an experienced developer or just trying to get into the industry, you need to stand out more than ever. The way you stand out is by staying ahead of the curve. Just look at any roadmap for any tech stack. There's a lot of information to be taken in, and to improve your chances, this is the stuff that you need to look at, and this is the stuff you need to learn. So in this video, I'm going to cover the optimal split so you don't waste time. How to achieve deep focus so we can actually start learning fast. And the only tools that you need to get going and, well, they're free. So to get started, weirdly enough, we're going to talk about running. When people are new to running, what they do is they put on their shoes and they go out and they just run. And that pace is typically something you'd refer to as race pace. And you think, oh, you know, I want to I wanna run 10 kilometers. So you go out every couple of days and you run at what you think is difficult, which is probably about 80% effort, right? You're not going to kill yourself because, I mean, you're just doing this as a hobby and you're not going to underdo it because you want to see some kind of improvement. And it sounds logic, but the reality is this is possibly the worst way to get good at running. This effort range only makes up about 20% of your gains. If you really want to improve, you spend 80% of your time doing zone 2 training, which is a light jog. And then the remaining 20% you spend doing zone 5. You don't do any race pace effort. The only thing that doing race pace effort actually gets you good at is getting a feeling for what it's like to run. It's not really contributing to your long-term progression, which is why you find people that will show up to a park run every weekend and always run the same speed. It's because they're not actually doing the things that will drive that improvement. And the chances are you're doing the same with coding. There's this absolute obsession with grinding leak code questions, where people flex these incredibly complex algorithm problems that, in reality, you just never see in your day-to-day -day work. Maybe if you're at the cutting edge of quant work, or you're actually solving scientific theorems, but this stuff is basically your, your race pace <laughs> beginner learning where the person thinks that, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this all the time and I'm gonna get really good, when in reality, you're just burning time. You need to focus on the things that are actually gonna return value to you. So what does this look like for software engineers? Well, in a previous video, I actually broke this down. I was very fortunate that when I started software, I was hired to learn to code. So a company was paying me to learn. And so I went from never having written production level code in my life, only dabbling with hobby stuff, to sprint ready in about three months. And I broke down how my days looked and how the weeks looked and what those tasks were and got to these numbers here. So my time was spent either doing learning theory, like the actual basics of my language, uh, progressing to more advanced theory, greenfield work, so actually making an app from scratch just to, you know, really, just to understand bottom up what the language is like, and then time spent in the company's existing code base, solving bugs, adding features, being given tasks as if it was real sprint work. How do you think my time was split? These are the numbers <laughs> that attach to them, and I think they might surprise you. So you'd have the tiny little sliver of 8%, the slightly bigger sliver, of 16% and then moving from the crumbs to the full cake, the 76%. Well, the smallest driver was the theory work. The larger one was Greenfield work, making an app from scratch, which, I mean, if you, if we're talking about somebody who is new to the industry and wanting to move into it, you're probably learning the theory and then trying to start a project. That's the normal advice, right? But the reality is that probably makes up around 26% of what you should be sinking your time into. The real meat of what's going to make you good at your job, dealing with an existing code base. That's most of what your work's going to be. So maybe if you're working nine to five, you know, use this as an example. Maybe you're going to spend that entire time because you work for a company just working in the existing code base. But when you get in of an evening, you're going to spend an hour working on a personal project just to keep just to keep the needle moving, building something from scratch. Because the problem with becoming too embedded in a company software is that you start forgetting the peripherals once you've set up your services and you've got your dependency injection and all that kind of stuff you can forget it because when, you, when are you going to ever touch that again that system's set up and it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna fall out of practice and then if the company wants a new product or if you move to a new company that doesn't have these systems maybe you've forgotten how to do it okay let's color code these and I actually made a video quite recently about what I think you should be doing for theory. And I think YouTube is such a good resource because people are incentivized to make learning fun. So maybe just slot in a YouTube video here and there. 
you know, because it's these tiny little increment. If you do this over weeks, sure, it's only 10 minutes here or there, but it's going to make up hours and you're going to be doing much better than somebody who does no theory. Obviously, this would look different if you're new. OK, so now let's talk about the next elephant in the room, which is this obsession with this study grind set culture of, you know, study with me 12 hours and this is supposedly a good use of your time. And it flies in the face of the whole four hour work week culture that there was a couple of years ago where actually it was less about doing as much as human possibly and more to do with optimizing your time so you got the most out of it. And people don't talk about it, but you've got big scientific figureheads that will give you the focus toolkits of the many different tools that you can use. And don't get me wrong, like I use a lot of these, but step one is the basics, which we seem to forget. If you do a psychology degree, the first thing, one of the first modules you do is something called mind, body, brain, and it's the connection between the three. You know, if a patient comes in and is mentally ill, before you go down the list of potential things that could be going wrong in their life, look at the fundamentals, because someone with a terrible diet who stays up until 1am every night playing League of Legends, well, maybe stopping those bad habits might actually get them to the point where they're able to solve their, the rest of their problems by themselves. So step one, sleep. Are you regularly sleeping and are you getting enough sleep? And you might say, oh, well, you know, I can sleep five hours and I'm absolutely fine. I can guarantee you that if you try and do a solid eight hours of problem solving and writing code, this is not true. The time that you will need to sleep will increase. If you are sleeping that little, it's probably because you're just not doing that much. Rain it in. I go to bed at 10 and I wake up at 6 in the morning. This doesn't change. I don't watch movies past 10. I don't play video games past 10. I have a set bedtime because I'm an adult and I need to function as well as possible. And if you want to stay ahead of people, you need to function better than people. And most people, I think, are ignoring this. And it's one of the biggest drivers of, of your general well-being. Sleep. From both, a mental health, from both a mental health perspective where there's the famous quote, if it was a drug that could be prescribed, it would be the most prescribed drug because, because of the outsized benefits it has on your mental well-being. Second one, diet. How much of your diet is ultra-processed food and are you over or underweight? Get it in check because, again, mind, body, brain. It's all connected. If you have an unhealthy body, your brain is part of your body. It's going to struggle with it. You're going to struggle focusing for long periods of time if you're having crazy insulin and glucose spikes and your body can't keep up because... You're just slamming the caffeine button until, like, I don't know, 10 p.m. And then you fall asleep and then, yeah, sure, maybe you go to sleep between 10 and 6 in the morning. But it's terrible quality because either you've got alcohol or caffeine in your system and your brain just doesn't get the recovery it needs. And I don't want to sound like a parent or something, but social media, anything with infinite scrolling that you have on your phone and you wonder why when you sit down to learn coding within five minutes you're scrolling through TikTok, it's because you've got, you've got cocaine in your pocket. If you've ever been on a diet, you know that one of the best ways that you can stick to it is just not have unhealthy food in the house. Because no matter how disciplined you are, at some point you'll come in from work, you'll be you'll be hungry and you'll be tired. And if there's a tub of ice cream in the in the freezer, you're gonna go in and you're gonna devour a thing. If there's no ice cream in the freezer, you're not gonna do it. Same thing goes for distractions, right? If on if in your pocket you've got unlimited fun and excitement, and in front of you you have hard boring slow work which don't get me wrong coding isn't always that it is interesting and exciting and it's a great job and worthwhile moving towards if you've got that dopamine button in your pocket you're gonna pull it out and you're gonna stop doing whatever you're doing because fundamentally we're human we're not machines if you get rid of the things that, if you get rid of the things that distract you suddenly the world becomes a lot easier and considering most people have every app under the sun on their phone this is going to give you a massive competitive advantage straight away. Because how many people do you know that don't have social media? If you really need it, just have it on a separate device. Don't don't have it on your phone. Or if you need to have it on your phone, leave your phone in the other room when you're doing this. But make it hard to get to because, I mean, in reality, you might end up leaving it in the living room, going back to, I don't know, check the time, and then the next thing you know, you've lost two hours to TikTok. But that's on you. Right. So lastly, what tools do we need? Well, for coding, that's going to be pretty self-explanatory. You just need whatever IDE works best for your tech stack and carry on. You know, I, I this isn't a tutorial of how to code. It's how to learn to code. And I think the only learning tools that really you would need outside of the system of, I mean, 
these two are taken up by you using an IDE, writing and running and debugging and working you through, working your way through, working on code in general. I think the main one is theory and business knowledge, which is something I haven't mentioned yet. And I have a video on this as well, but fundamentally all you need is a note taking app and a space repetition learning app. Now, the two that I use, for a while I used Notion and Anki, and now I use Obsidian and Anki, but really, use your buddy Note app, I'm not your dad. Notion was really good because it was online, so it's easy to access whenever I needed it. Anki is the thing that will change your life if you haven't heard of it, and if you have heard of it and you're not using it, get back to using it, because it is crazy how effective this thing is. I know you probably have this this presupposition about flashcards and how you never did them in school and you were fine but trust me this is worth it just try it and if it doesn't work after a week delete it i was wrong you can leave a comment and say that i'm an idiot but i'm willing to bet that this is worth looking into it's very simple all you do is every time you learn something write questions about it with answers put them onto flashcards this software will ask you for questions and the ones that you get right straight away it won't show you for like a week or two and the ones that you get wrong it shows you more often so across time what happens is you say you built up hundreds maybe even thousands of flashcards it will only show you a couple of day because some it will only, it will show you i have some that it only shows me every couple of years but then there's some that i forget all the time especially where i'm in biotech i've got some biology that I find very difficult to learn, which shows me every week. And then if the question ever comes up in a stand up or a meeting about it, I know I've got it off the top of my head immediately because they ask the question and I've memorized the question with the answer. And I'd say once the only thing remaining, I would say, is probably <laughs> the classic. What does the routine look like? What is optimal? How do you do it if you work and how do you do it if you don't have a job and you're looking to get one? Well, if you look down below, I have a link to my newsletter and if you sign up, I'll send you the routine that I use when I work from home, when I'm in the office, because I'm hybrid, so I have one for each. So it will apply to you guys, whether you're remote workers or, or in office. And I'll also send you what I used when I was learning, and that was my main process. And you never mind the nine to five, what I would do if I needed maybe a part-time job. Or I was in uni, so I had every hour to study. And to be fair, when I was in uni and I had every hour to study, I used a lot of those hours. I was on that 12 hour study with me grind set. There's a time and a place for different techniques, and I'll give you each of them. If you're looking for a bigger breakdown on those two tools I just mentioned, Obsidian and Dunkey, I actually made a six minute video here. I, tr I cover as much as you need pretty fast and the logic behind it. I hope that video helps. Cheers.